once again, everyone, thank you for joining us to another version of, or session of, Top Virtual Staffing Solutions Virtual Town Hall. And for today's session, we are going to discuss in regard to prevention and continued healthcare services through our COVID-19 reality. And for today's session, we have Stephanie Owings of Amedesis to discuss a little bit further regarding this subject matter. So Stephanie, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. All right, so I know we've already did the introduction a little bit with the teaser, but if you can dive a little bit deeper with what you do, especially with the medicines, especially in this world of our, of COVID-19. Absolutely, so um, home care has been around uh, for quite some time, of course, and our goal is to be able to keep patients at home and become as independent as possible um, and adapt to their home settings, whether it be an assisted living or a regular home. Um, during COVID, uh, we've taken the role as kind of the practitioner's eyes and ears to take care of some of those patients that have chronic diseases and aren't able to see their physicians regularly or their specialists. So we're kind of our nurses are out there taking on helping them manage a lot of those disease processes. Wonderful, thank you. And before we continue, some legalese if you may. <laughs> so again, we are doing these from an informational and educational point of view. Please make sure you reach out to your rightful professionals if you may in regard to everything that we will be discussing here. And given that, especially that we are concentrating on COVID-19, that things are changing and being updated uh, minute by minute, day by day. So please make sure that some of the things we'll be sharing right now could be a little bit different in the future, in the near future, down the line. So again, uh, just for educational and informational purposes only. So we're, well, we're back here. <laughs> No, absolutely. I mean, it, it, regulations are changing every day. Um, insurances are changing, you know, their standards every day. So it definitely is a, a changing time right now. Okay. On that note, at this point in time, uh -huh. all right, the date is June 4th. <laughs> <laughs> what is it that you can go ahead and share that have the uh, Regarding changes, uh, yeah, let's tackle it maybe from insurance point of view and why it's sure. still important to work with a medicist or, talk, or working with professionals. And then later on, a big chunk regarding what are the standards that we have been using to protect everyone. Sure. Uh, one of the major things um, that has occurred is in relation to Medicare um, during COVID as of today as well. They are uh, lifting a lot of their restrictions in regards to homebound status, which is one of the reasons why home health care sometimes is able to be into the home because it's difficult for patients to leave their home to go to therapy, rehab, that sort of thing. With COVID-19 and the restrictions, even as of today, um, a majority of the population that has Medicare um, are your higher risk uh, patients still, and they are still being asked to stay at home if at all possible. So Medicare has allowed us to come in even at those times where they're not necessarily considered completely homebound. We are able to come in just during COVID to help manage um, where they can't go out frequently. And on that note, especially that population right uh, that they are considered to be higher risk is that that's still accurate correct correct okay now on that note is it, is it medicare part a or medicare part b or both could still be used from that perspective so we are um, a regular home health agency uh, bills under medicare part a um, and our services are covered 100% under the Medicare Part A. Um, Medicare Part B is an option that there are some agencies out there that are covered under Medicare Part B that can also come into your home and be considered in-home outpatient. Sounds crazy, but that's what they're called. 
And then Medicare Part B or secondary insurances, uh, like outpatient therapy, like yours, are covered under the, those secondary insurances as well. Precisely. So on that note, because with our before COVID nineteen, right, we were able to do home visits as well uh, judiciously. And obviously, again, when you have established that, okay, this person is not homebound anymore. So does that mean that because of this reality and, they ha and Medicare has changed, would you be able to continue as a, for a medicist or any other home-based uh, therapy services out there? Does it mean that you are able to continue providing Medicare Part A services even if, in essence, they're not homebound anymore? I hope my question makes sense. Yes, we can do that as of today, as of right now. Okay. Um, Medicare lifts those uh, softening of regulations for homebound status, then those patients that would be able to go to outpatient that we're seeing in the home would be asked to do so. Okay, that's good then. That, that's, and I think that's what you mentioned earlier, but I had to view it from, from that perspective. So no, that's, yes, absolutely. Okay, so you, in short, you can continue your services through Medicare Part A because of those restrictions have been lifted. Correct. Okay, and then if ever, when do you think Part B will go ahead and come in or you can just go ahead and continue to go ahead and make them as functional as possible so under right so under medicare part a our goal is to make goals for the patient until they plateau is kind of what we said mm -hmm. so if it gets to the point where they're as independent as possible on what we call a skill end like they've met all the goals that we've set with them they feel comfortable that's as good as they can possibly get at this point then we even before covid would possibly refer to an outpatient therapy to maintain what we, what they've done in the home or a Medicare Part B inpatient, you know, in-home therapy to do more of a maintenance program. Okay, so if, if the goals aren't being met anymore, as you mentioned, maintenance program, that's where Medicare Part B will go ahead and come in then? Correct. Okay, which can be done still at home or as I'm reading some news that even non-essential places are opening up at 50% capacity, is that correct? Correct, I think some um, some gyms and areas like that are sometimes doing some outdoor classes and, and that sort of thing as well. Okay, so on that note, uh, for our physical therapy practice at AAA Physical Therapy, we continue to follow the guidelines provided by CDC, state, federal, state, and local guidelines and so, and that's why we are working together in, in this regard. But it's really great that uh, you are able to continue to provide services, especially for Medicare Part A, again, because of special circumstances and that, you get, that th these are still covered 100% by Medicare Part A. You're correct, okay. yes. Now, uh, why? Because obviously, before COVID-19, you guys are fully functional, we're fully functional, and these health and services are, are there. Now, obviously, things changed, and then it's, it's being modified right now. Everybody still needs, everybody that needs therapy is still a requisite, and that all of these health services are still in demand. Why is it important for our community members to focus the, on the prevention piece, especially, instead of waiting for things to get worse? That's a great question. I think that what we found is you're right. You know, um, this population or any population, when people are saying, you know, stay at home, limit visitors, and then we call and say we want to come into your home, it's kind of disheartening. Like, why is it any different for you to come in than it is for someone else? Um, I think what's important to understand is that there are specific regulations that we're following in order to protect our staff members as well as the patients that we're following now so that we can continue to provide the, that care in the home. What we're finding a lot is that we've gotten a lot more referrals with skilled nursing services to help manage some of those disease processes 
But with that, with them not allowing physical therapy in as much, it's we're also noticing in our assisted livings and stuff that there has been physical decline at some point for some of our patients. Because again, the services were kind of stalled or or stopped, if you may, right? Correct. Correct. And and especially right now because the gyms were closed, rightfully so. And again, staying at home, now all of a sudden, as that wasn't already an issue beforehand, you can easily imagine that this have gotten worse the past two months. Absolutely. And that is why we are providing these healthcare services. Uh, uh, do you guys provide telehealth or no, not yet? We provide telehealth nursing. We are working on the telehealth therapy part. Okay, that's good. And that's also covered both uh, by Medicare Part A on your end. Correct. Yes. Okay, sounds good. Because on our end, the same thing in terms of Medicare Part B. So by all means, that's what we need to do. We need to continue to have physical distance as much as possible. I think that's still taken into effect. And if we're going out, even with non-essential things, again, really figure out that you are doing it because you absolutely have to. And right. then, but at the same time, in terms of your health services, I mean, this AAA physical therapy and all of these other services out there are still able to go ahead and function and help you out in one shape or form. So again, find out if they have telemedicine or telehealth services. And then again, because of, of, the, con of the concerns of people visiting you, and that's what we'll talk more next, is again, these services are are covered by Medicare Part A and Part B. So make sure you contact us or contact your healthcare provider in order to clarify what services are covered. In short, these services continue and we are all being creative on how to make it work while at the same time that is still covered by insurance. Now, Correct. Um, okay, I need your services. I call yeah. All you guys, but I'm mm -hmm. concerned. Hey, I, I I don't know what to do. I'm I'm high risk, and it's not only because of my age group. Let's say I have other uh, like comorbidities. Yes, comorbidities exactly. In terms of uh, I have asthma or any other breathing issues or anything to that effect. How can you secure me as a non medical professional that we will be that we will all be safe? Not only me, but also you. So. Absolutely. So, unfortunately, with this, we're learning that even people who don't have symptoms are, in fact, infected. The only thing that that we can do is monitor ourselves and monitor our patients. So, before any of our clinicians go out into the field, they do a self um, self exam. I, I would say, and you know, monitoring, and has to, they have to send that into our care centers prior to even seeing patients that day. If there's any symptoms whatsoever, any abnormalities, we ask them to not go into work that day, and then we monitor them closely. They also call every single patient, uh, every single patient before going out to ask them the same questions to see how they are feeling, not necessarily saying that we're not going to go out to see them, but to make sure that we have the proper equipment needed in order to care for them. So if there's a patient that we're seeing that all of a sudden when we call them in the morning, they say, I don't know, I've had a, a high temperature last night, I have a little bit of a cough. Our nurse can still go out to see that patient. What we're going to do, though, is we're going to wear, instead of a regular surgical mask, we're going to wear a new N95 mask and protect ourselves a little bit more so from the, you know, protect the patient as well as ourselves. Um, so it's, we're going out there and we're still helping and we have all the PPE that we need in order to provide that care, thankfully. Um, and we're just trying our best to protect our patients and our staff uh, through monitoring. Okay. And it goes both ways as well because I know contact tracing is something that at least in our local government, they're trying to go ahead and establish. And I know that's, you know, countywide, statewide, and federally, mm -hmm. that's what we're trying to continue. So monitoring yourselves as medical professionals, and then if, for example, if 
I have been in close contact with somebody, whether it's a neighbor, coworker, what have you, and somebody calls me that they are an official contact tracer, and then that's something that I need to inform you as well, correct? Correct, and we've had that quite a few times um, in order, you know, it's been a family member or somebody, not even our patient, but had contact that they, they are asked to call us and they have done so. Okay, and if that is the case, how long if, do I need to be quarantined? We, for our uh, staff, do a 14-day quarantine um, with daily monitoring of symptoms. So if I don't show symptoms in 14 days, I'm good to go? Correct. Now, is it mandatory that I be tested as a medical professional and or as a community member? It is not mandatory on our end at this point. It is recommended. Okay. Um, it's not mandatory. Okay. Sounds good. Because obviously we all hear about the limitation of tests, but I know slowly we are able to establish those things a little bit further. Is that something that you would highly suggest that if, let's say, if I was impacted with a contact trace, if I was contacted with a, by a contact tracer, or even without showing symptoms, or for medical health professionals, what, what's, what, what's, what's, I know you said recommended, I, you know, I look at it more as a nurse, you know, as the nurse and the medical side of it. Um, yes. So I, I know, and what I know that a lot of our um, clinicians and there hasn't been many that have been exposed, but any who have, they feel and they have done testing just to make sure that their loved ones, their families, the other patients that they're caring for when they return, they know uh, whether or not they are positive or not in order to safely take care of them. And if I'm, a, as a community member, I have to wait until I have symptoms, or can I go ahead and say, hey, I, I want to be tested now because I'm, I'm living with everybody else here? One of the great things is with the ability that we do have now with more testing and not necessarily needing all those physician's orders for some, for, you know, it was physician orders and actual symptoms that required you to get testing. With some of that lifted, our nurses are even able to come out to do that testing in home whether you're sad or not. Lovely. I'm glad I'm asking these questions. Yes, that's great. <laughs> so you said you guys can go ahead and do it. We absolutely can. Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> awesome. And uh, is this test the one where it takes days or hours? I, I know there's it, two types of tests. I think the one that we are specifically, it's the nasal pharyngeal one that we are doing, and that is anywhere between 24 to 48 hour turnaround time. Okay. And I, I guess that 24 to 40, 48 hour turnaround time is the, that's, that's the more accurate one versus the kind of a microwave one that you get. Correct. Of, I'm pretty uh, sure that this is the same one that the hospitals are doing um, okay. as well. All right. Now, here's a, a question as well. Who's, who's, who's covering that? Is insurance covering that? or Insurance does cover that. Uh, even for um, insurance for patients covered at 100%. Um, insurance for employees, depending upon their insurance, they might have that copay. Uh, for patients that do not have any insurance, there is a kind of a bucket grant that is available in our state that allows us to still test them and pay for it out of that bucket. Oh, lovely. So bottom line is that we reach out to you and find out what is covered or what we, what's a responsibility on my end. Correct. Okay, lovely. And so on that note, I assume we can continue to work together wherein, for example, when we, as we continue to have patients in our cl clinic, and if somebody wants to be tested, you can go to our clinic. Is that accurate? You, uh, what we do is if the patients are in caseload, we have our uh, testing equipment there in order to do it. If the patient is not on our current services, we have contacts with different diagnostic teams that can provide the testing kits, and we can go out as the nurse to be able to do that collection, um, or we can train somebody, or the diagnostic company trains somebody else to be able to administer that. Lovely. Okay, good, good. Great. Wow. This is awesome. Now, uh, okay, I think we have covered that. 
I feel a little bit more confident that people coming in here, I mean, if, if nobody has contacted me or nobody's being showing symptoms in my household or wherever I'm, I'm involved with people, then I feel confident that you are able to go ahead and come in and help us out. So what else can you go ahead and say of the importance of prevention or, or getting services from a medicine or any other homebound services? I mean, I, I think one of the things to keep in mind, uh, specifically this time, is that it's so important on a regular basis, not just at this time, to follow a lot of these prevention and safety things that we're doing on a regular basis. Hand washing is ideal. Hand sanitizer is ideal. Make sure that you cover your cough. Make sure that you're, you know, you're limiting unnecessary exposure just on a regular basis with flu season and all this that's, you know, come up, I think that it's important just to not stop doing these safety measures. Of course, limit some of the intensity of them um, when it's not necessary, but do not stop being safe and thinking that uh, on a regular basis, you could come in contact with any virus. And you just need to protect yourself as best as you can. Okay. Because it can be a little bit uh, misleading. I mean, it's good right now that the weather is warming up. The sun is, right. bit, you know, out there and hotter. But still, virus can still live around and about on surfaces or when you're talking to people, especially for not wearing masks and the likes, correct? Absolutely. As of right now, that is what has been found. But they, that is definitely changing on a regular basis what they're determining with the virus. Okay. Now, this is a, uh, this could be a, how should I say this nicely? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> obviously, watching the news, uh, you will hear some individuals going and, and saying that, that they still, how should I say this? Um, so, you are taking, you are taking the necessary precautions. Correct. What if I go ahead and say, nope, I don't want to wash my hands. Nope, I, let's say in short, whatever the possible standards are. Mm -hmm. What if I am not compliant with the recommendations or what's mandatory and the likes? How do you, how are you going to work with me if I am your patient or if I'm a caregiver and go ahead and say, no, I don't need to do all of those things? I, I think more about I it. No, that's a good question. So I think what, which is fortunate, is we're finding that um, at the start of services, we're very clear as to our expectation to be able to protect our clinicians as well as the patient and families and what our expectations are for safety for them as well as us coming into the home. Um, just like anything else, if at any point our clinicians feel unsafe or um, the, the client is not following the education or the guidelines that we are following in order to properly care for everyone, um, then we would have to call their provider and possibly discontinue them off our services. And so if I get uh, a little bit intense with you, you're not going to give in? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. That's good to know. I mean... <laughs> these are realities out there that you know we all want to wish that everybody would be following what science says but it, it and at the same time I, I try to comprehend or have see that perspective but at the same time especially we're medical health professionals or in the in the medical health field we have to follow such guidelines so absolutely and we always say with every patient that we're able to help on services we're actually helping 10 people within their circle other than just them so we're not just in contact with the patients we're in contact with the family members with the caregivers with the physicians and it's important that if they're not protecting themselves taking precaution they're keeping everyone at risk and you know what after having gone through the contact tracing uh, Coursera course. I don't know if you're familiar with that mm -hmm. from Hopkins. Yes. So, uh, yes. I, I Would you highly suggest that all of our community members would actually take something like that or similar like that? And it's free it's so that all of us will be a little bit more educated. 
I, I, I hope that people do. I think it's, I mean, as a nurse, I never stop loving to learn. So for me, I always love to learn new things. I hope that there's more time for people to take that time to do that. Stuff is slowed down a little bit in some ways. So I think it's important for them to take the time to understand and definitely educate themselves. Precisely. And well, guess what? I mean, I hear some news as well that people are quote unquote bored or they don't know what to do. And just like what Stephanie identified, it, it's not, it will, it will actually do you good <laughs> to go ahead and learn a little <laughs> bit more of something. And just like what she identified that if I'm helping you out, you're helping also 10 individuals in your respective cohort group or your group, close-knit group. And, and that's what it is, that it's not only about myself, but everybody else around us. So, so by all means, feel free to go ahead and, and search out there regarding contact tracing and just be a little bit more knowledgeable with what's the, what are the updates, if you may, with COVID-19. So uh, on that note, because that is written by uh, or authored by an epidemiologist, and listening to these experts, they're warning us that us, uh, if we do not continue with our physical distancing, uh, it will get worse come winter time. Is that something from your own medical circle is also saying? Or, and if that's a yes, what can we continue to do then? We haven't actually kind of looked that far ahead yet. Um, and our company hasn't really spoken too much of that. We're, we're mainly doing the day by day, week by week to manage and update ourselves and our clinicians on any changes that may be needed. So we haven't looked that far ahead, but it's definitely something that's, uh, you know, I listen to the news as well. It's, you know, it, it might not be just going away, even though things might be changing okay. to get back to our so-called normal. All right. And then with my last virtual town hall with Delegate Mary Hill, and she is a medical doctor as well. And, and I know we, before going into this session today, uh, I, I know we, we try to go ahead and make sure that we are on the same page with whatever questions. So this may be a curveball for you, but it's, no. a bit, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a little bit related to our initial conversation before we were recording. Okay. So as we slowly open things up and And, okay, you, you mentioned that, uh, at least in our local hospital here, uh, are you comfortable sharing whatever the current reports are in our, in our hospital regarding COVID-19? Yeah, I'll just say that a, a local hospital that I spoke with, um, absolutely. Mm -hmm. They um, definitely, we get, I, I like to get regular weekly updates to see how their census is and how their statuses for um, potential COVID, probable COVID, COVID patients or COVID positive patients on their unit, um, as well as it includes the ICU um, and how that, you know, how that is being managed. And when I did speak um, this week with the local hospital, they did say it was kind of a good and a bad. Um, there is more positive COVID patients that are coming into the hospital, their COVID unit is full with probable COVID or COVID positive patients. However, the important thing for them on their end was that the ICU numbers were down, which meant that the patients were not becoming as acutely ill from the disease that previously they had been. Yes, as you mentioned, that's both good and bad. And it's possible that it sounds bad because it we are doing more tests right now. Correct. The numbers are going to go up because we're doing more testing. We're doing more testing. Okay. Now, this is uh, before, and, and feel free to go ahead and decline if you're not comfortable to answer it, uh, and because it's a, it's a little bit sensitive right now. Uh, so with 
when, when, when I was talking to Dr. Hill and she was saying that uh, if, for example, we open up Ocean City and then there are already a lot of pictures or videos that there's no physical distancing and just open up two, three weeks ago and those things are happening. And then with what's happening to our country right now with, uh, with, with speaking up to certain levels of injustices and obviously uh, physical distance is going to be an extreme challenge. Correct. And, and so obviously those are the numbers right now as, you've, as you have heard from our local hospital here. I mean, at the end of the day, of course, why not enjoy the beach, you know? Of course, go ahead and, and share to institutions that there are certain things that we need to go ahead and change and modify. Mm -hmm. But uh, obviously, in, in both sides, there's no physical distancing. Uh, is there any way for you to project on how things will be in the next few weeks or next month? Or, or <laughs> I don't know if you kind of understand where I'm trying to lead my question. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that me and my goodness, we were talking before this, that tomorrow uh, changes that, you know, we do a whole other phase of reopening things um, in Maryland. So I think that the key of what is not going to go away right away, and I think is what the doctors and, you know, the specialists are all saying is that the social distancing is a big part of the decreased impact on medical personnel. I mean, the, the more people that are sick at the same time, the harder it is to treat them. So I think going to Ocean City and setting up your beach stuff six feet away from another family and, you know, wearing a mask when you're on the boardwalk a close contact with people, I think that that's something that's probably not going to change over the summer. Um, but I think it's been shown at some point to work. And it's the same way with the, you know, like the, what we're seeing now, you're right with the, you know, the protests and stuff like that. It's just important to continue to wear masks, stay social distance as much as possible and still be a, a, a group together just in a different way. And at the end of the day, if you are one of many protesting peacefully, mm -hmm. and w whether the reports are true or not, but if tear gas and stuff like that are being used, definitely you need to wear a mask to begin with anyway. Yeah. So again, we, we I don't want to digress too much from that. Be as safe as possible, uh, whether for leisure or for noble causes, or just going out and about with uh, as non-essential locations continue to open up. So there. Um, all right. Now going back to the prevention piece on the medical side, not only, not from a COVID nineteen side. Mm -hmm. Why should we continue to work with nurses, physical therapists, occupational therapists? Why should we continue to go ahead and do that? I mean, I think that the, the major thing that we're finding is that telehealth, although it's working to be able to maintain contact with people, it's not that in-person assessment. It's not that in-person management. And, you know, when we all go to a doctor, we expect them to listen to our heart, listen to our lungs, look at our feet, you know, make sure that everything's okay, check our blood pressure, and you can't do that necessarily over a telehealth physician call. Um, so our goal is to continue to maintain that personal contact um, and help those physicians that aren't able to go out in the homes to, like I said, kind of be their eyes and ears and still make sure that those, those clients are, are still okay. Okay. And I'm glad that you brought that up. So on that note, care to share or provide further information and say, hey, I just want to do telehealth right now. So you've already identified all kind of hard to listen to all of those things that I have to physically do it with you. Um, right. So what the, what are the other things that can be done from your perspective in terms of telehealth? I mean, I think that how we've kind of managed it is there, you know, 
helping people to get their self-monitoring blood pressure cuffs, helping them to get, you know, a diary going of their um, diabetes management, their their logs, that sort of thing, so that although they're not in the doctor's office, they can share with their physician how they're managing some of those diseases that they normally wouldn't have kept track of. Um, we are also, you know, if a patient only wants to have a couple of visits and they're concerned for more than a couple of visits, then we can see them several times and then put them on what we call a hold, a COVID hold, which is allowed um, under Medicare um, for at least a, a three-week time frame and then a reevaluation in person would be needed in order to continue to maintain that hold. Um, but it is possible for us to manage around the limiting of the visits if somebody's not comfortable with that. Okay. And uh, now moving to visits, I know we've already discussed what you guys did with wearing N95 masks and so on and so forth. Are there, aside from your attire, and and actually I just want to go ahead and share this. Um, <laughs> you, you guys are wearing pretty much like a hazmat suit, rightfully so. <laughs> and it's summer right now. I hope everybody will go ahead and understand and appreciate that these services continue to are continue to be provided, and that's how dedicated all of you guys are. And I don't know if you're comfortable to be called as a hero, but or Shiro, <laughs> you guys are doing a lot of things for our community members, and and with that, I. I appreciate you guys. We appreciate you guys for continuing to do that. So, uh, thank you. I definitely say our clinicians are our heroes for sure. Okay. All right. Wonderful. So, <laughs> on, that, on that note, aside from wearing all of that, are there any other cha changes in terms of the of the services that are being provided uh, in person compared to prior COVID nineteen? I, I hope you understand my question there. No. So, you know, when our, when our therapists and our nurses go out to do an assessment, they determine how frequently the visits they feel like should be. Mm -hmm. We still make those recommendations during COVID. Um, and it is up to the patient and the caregiver to be agreeable to that frequency of visits. So our goal is still to provide all the necessary treatment we need as long as the patient and caregiver are okay with that. So the services still remain the same practically? Correct. Okay, wonderful. All right, good, good. Okay, so uh, is there any other question that I may, I failed to ask or, you know what, this is something that we need to discuss or converse or share? Uh, anything uh, that I may have missed or, or if there's anything that you need to highlight? No, I mean, I, I, you did an amazing job. Thank you, by the way. <laughs> um, no, I think that it's important for people to understand that um, there are home health services out there that are available, whether it be a social worker, whether it be, uh, we have so many community members, as you know, you know, we all work together to try to take care of patients at all levels. So it could be contacts that we may have, it could be uh, that you don't really need a nurse in, but you're not sure if you need something else, you know, we are available, I think all of us um, in the industry to really just be a resource for anyone out there. And I'm, I'm glad that you brought up the social worker because, uh, I, I mean, I, I'm still confused why <laughs> we are using the phrase social distancing. It's just wrong from a semantic point of view. Sure. It, it should be physical distancing, correct? Correct. We, uh, social is probably the worst thing we can do at the isolation time. Exactly. But yeah. <laughs> and, and I understand that we need to have a common language or lingo that we should be using. Right. You know, from, from, from the federal to local to community members. And, I'm one of those individuals that it's actually physical distancing. <laughs> Maybe well, I'll have to change my wordage of that as well. I'm not sure. I, I I kind of just went with the flow, but you're right. It's actual physical distancing. It's not social distancing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hopefully my my 
the way I work with you, I communicate with you. Sure, it's a little bit different. We're using all of these different online platforms, but hopefully the way I am with you is still rather the same. It's just that I can't shake your hand right now or, you know, give a hug or whatever, anything to that. So anyway, going back to social workers, and as you mentioned, especially right now, have you been hearing about social isolation as being an issue now and it's impacting their overall health and wellness? One of the things that, you know, is kind of near and dear to my heart is, that, you know, a lot of these nursing, uh, nursing facilities and assisted livings that, you know, these patients, you know, these clients that they have on a regular basis that aren't able to do group activities, aren't able to see their loved ones and the staff there at the facilities are doing all they can to be able to provide virtual visits and, you know, fun doorway bingo. And I just think it's important to recognize that, you know, social socialization, just as if we, when you discuss children, socialization with children in schools is just as important as socialization with, you know, rehab facilities and assisted livings and this is just a tough time for all of them um and you know i touch base with the social workers at our skilled nursing facilities frequently just to check in um ask if there's anything we can provide anything that their residents need um and they're just so appreciative sometimes just to know that there's somebody out there that's thinking about their residents because they're really trying to do the best they can and on that note where are my manners I'm sorry to miss to introduce you to Nico uh, and Ella. Okay. Nico and Ella, speaking of social, uh, <laughs> if you guys want to be on videos, the reason I missed it is because Miko is uh, our 10-year-old uh, intern, and this is one of the ways for him to be engaged with. <laughs> okay. And then Ella is uh, one of my teammates uh, regarding uh, top virtual staffing solutions. And the reason why I ask that from a social isolation point of view is because uh, that's one of the things that we can hopefully provide in relation to um, of, of having that virtual companion. And uh and as we both are members of Coalition of Geriatric Services, that, uh, that wherein I'm also a member of the age-friendly in Howard County, social mm -hmm. isolation was already an issue. Correct. So as part of the solution is that, of course, social workers, nurses, and so on and so forth are there to help out in that regard. But sometimes... Stephanie, I just want to talk to you about X, Y, and Z. You know what I mean? Right. right. And, and, and of course, I know you guys provide that as much as you can. Mm -hmm. but of course, you are also limited with some, you are limited by your functions and roles. But we do, like you said, we have partners out in the community that we do know that can provide that. Okay. And care to share who you are working with, if you don't mind? So no, so Allison Stanton is one that is a geriatric uh, specialist out in the community, um, and she, one of her roles is to provide that social worker aspect from advanced directives to placement of your loved ones to just being someone to talk to, taking her somebody to the doctors, making sure they're exercising. Um, so it's that that socialization and that overall encompass that social workers provide that is so important now out in the community. Yes. And on that note, that's why even on our end, we're doing these, uh, these exercise sessions or exercise buddy, workout buddy on Fridays, just in case if somebody just wants to go ahead and do that and, and have that social facilitation to, to, to go ahead and move and 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 that's what we, if there is that social yeah if there's that social facilitation that I'm doing it with somebody else it helps us accordingly absolutely and so okay thank you for sharing that and for us on our end if if virtual companionship can is needed that's something that can be provided and because 
we have teammates like Ella that is not US based, then uh, obviously there are voluntary services out there, but if you want something a little bit more consistent, that's something that we can provide at a fraction of the cost of, of what a minimum wage would be here. So um, there, so I just want to go ahead and share that out there. Miko and Ella, do you have any questions for our subject matter expert? <laughs> I'm not sure if you're speaking, Ella. We can't, I can't hear you. There you go. You're good? No questions? None? Okay. Miko, do you have anything for us? I assume silence is what it is. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So as we wrap this up, any, any, any last thoughts that you want to go ahead and share, uh, Stephanie? No, I just appreciate the time of, you know, you talking with us, with me, and um, this, I think this is wonderful what you were doing to be able to get some information out there, so thank you. We appreciate you, thank you, and uh, that's all we're trying to go ahead and do service with, because there are so many things out there that could be uh, questionable, to say the least, <laughs> so you'd rather <laughs> hear it from subject matter experts of what's what's the right thing to do, what's the best thing to do, and, and that have informed choices with whatever it is that they need to do. So, all right. So hopefully you guys uh, share this video uh, and watch out for other future working town hall sessions as things continue to evolve with our realities and with different areas of our lives. So again, just continue to be a critical thinker out there, a scientific out there. Just pretty much what I have shared in our strength press sessions regarding that. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you to Amedicis, okay? Thank you. Thank you for watching, and I hope you found this video informational and educational. Please share our videos and subscribe to our channel. If not, my dad will not give you.